Hey everybody, welcome to the latest edition of the Colpack and Izzo podcast, brought to you by Gate City Bank with Jeff Colpack. I'm Dom Izzo. We, we steamroll towards Memorial Day. As we record this, we are exactly 100 days out from the start of the college football season. Dom, you love the countdown, I do. man. You love the countdown. You wake up every morning <laughs> and you go to Courtney and go, Courtney, 98 <laughs> days. Yeah, I don't think she's excited about it as I am, but uh, it's an exciting day for those of us that follow it, and obviously we're super pumped about what's to come in 100 days. We've got a lot of work to do between then uh, and now. We'll get to football in a second. Also tonight, uh, the Summit League Baseball Tournament begins, not in Tulsa for the first time in I don't know how long, but in Omaha, Nebraska, the new baseball complex uh, down there as they won the last Summit League regular season in 2019. So the Mavericks get to host. They are the three seed, and they'll be facing second seed at North Dakota State Later tonight, I know you had a story on Ben and Hostel earlier this week. I did my commentary on this this program that has just gone under the radar and consistently wins despite playing 30-some-odd games in a row on the road to start the season. Todd Brown has built a program, and I know you are uniquely tied to the Bison baseball team, that for a while, I remember when I first got here, it just wasn't very good. Hold on, I'm not that tied. Well, we we were not that good. But you played. Like, well, I'm saying you played for the Bison baseball Couple team. So you're, back you're, in the 80s. you're connected yeah. to this. But in my job, I, I have to disassociate yeah. it, right? Yep. I'm, so that aside, yes, they have built a, a good product. They have more resources. They have a nice recruiting network. They they recruit right, I think, in in the upper Midwest. Hit Minnesota pretty hard. Yep. You're not going to bring Arizona kids up and be consistently good because half those guys are going to go. Oh, it is winter up mm-hmm. here, and you're always on the road. You got to find mentally tough kids, and mentally tough kids go on the road and, and go on the road for a month and a half and know that and succeed at it and do well at it. That's those kids are tough to find. It's it, it, it's I don't know if you go into the you have to put it up front and say you know what here's our schedule, here's where we play, right. but you're from West Fargo, you're from Fargo Davies, you're from Eden Prairie. Okay, this is what you, you, you know what you're you, signing up for. Yep, you've lived yep. this, and so this is what we have. And they found Bennett Hostiler in Bozeman. Yeah, Montana State doesn't have baseball though. Nope, that worked out uh, pretty good. You wrote from uh, about him about the crazy time that he's had of getting baseball in. He decided to come back for his super senior season. Five kids did. And boy, it, it worked out. Obviously, he was named Summit League Player of the Year yesterday. It's against the grain of most college players in the summer yes. even during the covid a lot of kids played during the summer somehow and in and in baseball you just keep playing you, you play in the spring you maybe take a week or two or how off till your wood bat season begins in the summer bennett and jake malik did it the other way around they went to duluth and i don't know they logged and worked out yeah. and did whatever they did out there didn't play and both came back and had really good seasons hostetler a credible season for not playing last summer, it, it goes against the grain yeah. of how college be- players operate. Three ninety four batting average. That's a couple points higher than yours. <laughs> Just a couple, huh? They've got a great shot. I mean, you all, you know better than I about this double elimination format. You got to win this one. You start off, you avoid the losers bracket as far as you can. You get this opening one, sets you set up really well for the rest of the tournament. He's, is he going to start Cade, the the true fresh? I think so. He's been and he's been really good. I, he was first team all summit league. Yeah, talking about Cade Feeney. And that's a little risky to to put a true freshman in right away. But you gotta play like you played all season. You can't yep. get to the postseason and, and just switch things up and coach differently. You can't do that. The players will take cue on that. And uh you got you it's another game, is what it is. I know it's a tournament, yep. but you can't go in there. And Tim Miles said this, Saul Phillips said this. And I learned it early. You can't coach a big game like a big game. Oral Roberts is mortal, too. They're good, but the Bison have beaten them a few times this season. Your teams have beaten them. And that's that's the, my point. Oral Roberts has come in so many times in this event where nobody was going to touch them, Jeff. They had three or four maybe major league guys on their roster that were going to make it maybe in the minor leagues. Uh, that's not this team. They're good, but they're not like the teams that were just untouchable from a few years ago. The Bison have something that they rarely have, and it's hard to do, is having a really good bullpen, and yeah. not just one guy, yep. but three or four. But they do have the closer in Parker Harm, yep. who's 91 to 93. He's got a, his arm is, is a little lower angle. 
I remember him pitching in high school baseball. He was good then. But too, he was not like yeah. this. No. He he is he has lights out right now. And I would be and so would Todd Brown shocked if he doesn't get a pro shot. Yep. Left hander that throws ninety one and ninety three. But you have that shutdown guy in the bullpen. And that's what you need this time of year. So Bison play tonight against Omaha at six. They win that. They move into the winner's bracket tomorrow. Obviously, the winner of this gets to the NCAA tournament. I I ask you this because obviously softball is in, has carved out a niche that people follow that. Why has baseball not done that? I, they haven't obviously had the success of softball or the success of track, frankly, because the track has, team has been unbelievable. Why isn't baseball? They've been consistently good. Why has that not happened in your mind? What happened for what? In terms of more people following them, more people oh, attending, attending games. Yeah. Either paying attention to them or going to the game. It's spring. It's spring. And that's why Northern coaches wanted to switch the season to from, later. Yeah, from March to, to, into July yes. rather than starting in February and then the College World Series in the middle of June. Yeah, Todd Brown's a huge proponent of that, actually. And they, I think they had some momentum going. And because the Southern coaches were going, gee, we don't draw that well in February, March anyway because of basketball. Yep. And so it made made sense for them. That movement just sort of died once, somehow. Once the pandemic hit, that kind of. But to hit answer the skids. your question, yeah, people would go out and, and watch NDSU baseball in June and Newman. Not yeah. they're not going to go in April. No, I I just watched an amateur baseball game last night. I had my I had two coats on. I was cold. <laughs> my son's team was up fourteen zero, and we I yeah. lost. Is Screw this, yeah. God. I've had enough of watching spring ball in the cold. Oh, man, I was cold this spring. And that was May 26th, by the way. I mean, we're, we should be past that, theoretically. I'm not sure if I'm thought out from you, Mary, at Sioux Falls game in Sioux Falls. <laughs> I don't think I've thought out yet. God, that was cold. Well, speaking of the cold weather, it's the perfect segue to chat about uh, football because this week, a uh, story that I, we were working on last week that North Dakota State and Oregon were close to announcing uh reschedule. I guess they were a lot closer than even Matt Larson wanted to, to yeah, intimate with me. I would say this is close. That uh, the game is back on for September 2nd, 2028. Now, we knew it was going to be a while away. We chatted about that on Hot Mike last week, Colpac, that it was not going to be necessarily uh, a couple years down the road. But it is un- unique, the fact that they got the game back on the schedule. Oftentimes, the FBS team will say, you know what? It didn't work out. So long, too bad on that. That that was not the case here. Yeah, I'm with McFeely. This is going to be a good Pac-12 game versus Mountain West game. <laughs> well, very well, it could be. Well, you never know. Never know on that far down the road. I'm on that train. Yeah. It's good for NDSU, obviously, getting Oregon. It's cool for Oregon to to say, okay, let's do this again. They, they could have said no. Yep. Because there was a previous administration at Oregon, right, that, mm-hmm. that approved this game, and then a new administration comes on and goes, you're playing who now? Yeah. Are you sure about yeah. this? So it was, it was it, I, I think the cool factor, because a lot of times in college athletics, you hear about the doggy dog world in recruiting and administration and games and all that stuff. It is a doggy dog world. But so kudos for, for Oregon for, for, for doing this. Todd Phelps, who now handles football scheduling, the deputy athletic director in the issue, told me the well is dry. It's either on FBS games now. It is either a hard no or talk to us in a couple of years, which also is a, is a no. Right. So the three games that the Bison have, Arizona next year, Colorado in 24, and Oregon in 28, might be it for a long time. A long time. It's not too soon to look ahead to that Arizona game. Yep. And oh, by the way, for Bison fans, I gotta, I've got been to Tucson a couple times. You fly Allegiant from Fargo <laughs> to Mesa, you rent a car, and it's an hour, 45-minute drive. Okay, that's the deal. On how to get there. That's the best deal. So what Phelps told me is now the destination games are becoming even higher a priority. Obviously, Mike is reported. It looks like that Eastern Washington will come to U.S. Bank Stadium for 23. Todd told me, and I've got it confirmed from another source, that the Texas Rangers have reached out about playing a football game at their new baseball stadium down in Arlington, Dallas. In um, 2025? 25 or uh, 24 or 25. Because that's still open there. They still have a game open. Yeah, but 24, you'd be at Colorado, and then you're at East Tennessee State. I don't think you could, you can't go three straight without. But that would technically, I think, be a t- considered a Bison home game. Like, uh, Yeah, but that's three games. I, away. I get that's you. That's not going to. that. 
That's, that's why, not going to make the Dome Authority happy. That's why 25 maybe makes more sense because 25 is wide open. But then you're at Central Tom. Arkansas. No, remember that got moved. Remember the 25 oh, yeah, game yeah, got yeah, moved yeah. to 26. You're, they're totally so open on 25. 25 could be the, the possibility, which obviously Bison fans know that area well. That And Las Vegas has been rumored about as well. Now, I that would, would think Vegas makes much more sense than the Rangers. I know the Rangers are close to Frisco, but it's not Frisco. It's not. It's and it's Dallas. not. A, and it's a baseball stadium as well. Granted, I know they played at Target Field, but they haven't done any football as far as I know at the new stadium that just opened last April down in Dallas. To me, Vegas makes much more sense. Boy, that'd be awesome. Look, look at what UND hockey did in Vegas. Yep. How many thousands they brought to that brought to awesome. th- that place. And plus, you have direct flight. Of the, I go back to Allegiant. Legion would probably add a couple. Are I you mean, sponsored by Allegiant now? Do I, have, I should. Do be. I have to throw that out there I before we be. start the pod? I'm just. I'm just giving free travel advice. Would they play at the new stadium? I wonder the the Raiders stadium there, or would they play where you and oh yo you and plays there now? So they would. Yeah, they play at that new state. Why wouldn't you? Man, I mean, you wouldn't fill it, but I think it'd make make right. it worth their while. How many fans do you think would go? Thirty. Yeah, thirty thousand oh, yeah. fans would go to Las Lot, Vegas. Yes, Lot, and and we're not talking just people from Fargo, North Dakota, Minneapolis would go, Arizona those, would go, all those West Coast engineers yep. and and people, all the Denver. That's not far. Yep. There's direct flight there. People in the Pacific Northwest. Well, everybody has there. a direct flight yeah. to Vegas, yeah. damn near. They have, that would I, make I, a I lot bet of Oswego sense. has a direct <laughs> flight to Vegas. <laughs> if anybody knows, my dad would. So I'll have to ask him on that front. That would be quite the scene. But that's where scheduling is going now. Those hoping for Nebraska to happen and, and Wisconsin, and I'm one of them, ain't going to happen. No. Those are just, it's not going to happen. And, unless North Dakota State decides to move up. And even then... Maybe the FBS front, because I've heard pushback on that front, because I've been the proponent, well, if they move up, those games would happen. I've had people say, well, Don, maybe not so much. But they'd rather play Bowling Green. Right. They'd rather play a Mac school than they know they can beat than rather uh, a Mountain West North Dakota State team. So the dilemma may still be there even at the next division up. Oh, dare to dream of the group of five and the potential for recruiting possibilities. Yep. Because you would own the upper Midwest. Well, there's no doubt on that. There would be... The closest would be Wyoming to the west, northern Illinois to the east. How about south? Who's uh, it? For a group of five? Directly south. <sighs> Nobody until... I'm really I'm really pushing I'd say, te- I'd say Texas, probably. There's nobody... Gotta of, be. Uh, Tulsa. Tulsa. Tulsa would be it. Oklahoma. That's... Because there's nobody in Kansas. Although, if you want to call Kansas, <laughs> Kansas football... Kansas is sort of uh, a group, group of five. five. You, could, you could call them that. Not Nebraska. Missouri, not, not Missouri. Nope, it would be all the way down there. It'd be Tulsa, Iowa, probably for sure. Not no. Iowa, nope. So, be a wide swath of the Midwest on that front. Okay, here's the other tidbit. And as long as here, the beauty of a podcast is you can go anywhere you want with it. <laughs> but back in 2000, I want to say three or four, when NDSU was making the move up to. Division One, along with South Dakota State, they were hand in hand. South Dakota State told, which was then the Gateway Football Conference, that because they just wanted South Dakota State, not NDSU, uh, not not the whole league, but there were several members. Is that right? I did not know that. Yeah, did you not read Horns Up? <laughs> it's been a while since I've read it. Yeah, me too. I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> I wrote this. That so, when they moved up, South Dakota State told the Gateway, "Okay, we'll move up, but you got to take North Dakota State." So they came as a package deal because they just wanted South Coast because mm. they knew they, well, it looks a little foolishly now. Right. They just thought they could only beat the Jackrabbits, who at the time were very pedestrian in Division Two, very average. And so if it wasn't for South Dakota State and Peggy Miller saying, okay, uh, we need us both. And then the, so they ultimately took both. Now, now that you're flipped, yeah. would NDSU go it alone? Yes. In group of five. Yes. They wouldn't hesitate on that. I believe so. Well, I don't. I don't think so. I, I, dog it's a doggy dog, dog world. Well, that's that's exactly how they go. I was just looking at this, by the way. Uh, group of five Midwest teams, right? Just so you're Tulsa. And, and, and I'm in the American right now, so you have Tulsa there. Then you're in Texas, SMU, Houston. We count Tulane. That's New Orleans. I don't count that Midwest. No. Uh, that's it in the American. Okay. Then you've got Conference USA. Western Kentucky, boy, that's getting that's, out that's, there. You're not close there. Uh, let's see. Then uh, Louisiana Tech, Texas San Antonio, 
Denton, North Texas, Rice, UTEP. It's all Texas damn, down there. You, you damn near so, have rights yeah. to the middle of the country for a group of five. I'm looking at the MAC then, just so it's Buffalo, no, Kent State, that's nah, Ohio, Ohio, not really, Miami no. of Ohio, no, Ohio, no. Akron, Bowling no. Green, no, Ball State, that's Indiana, no, no, you don't go to Indiana recruit, Western Michigan, no, no, Toledo, Ohio, no, Central Michigan, Eastern Michigan, Northern Illinois is it? That's it. Then if you look, the only other uh, power or group of five. Obviously not counting the Mountain West, because we know who the only close by is Colorado State and Wyoming. Yeah, you'd go against the Michigans. Is the, is the Sun Belt. You'd go against the Michigans for Wisconsin players and yep. Illinois players. And they, they've already out-recruited those schools for a few players. Yeah, and the only one in the Sun Belt that's close is Texas State. There ain't nobody close, Goldbeck, if they were to do it. That's interesting. That gets lost, too, and when talking about that potential move up on that, of how wide the footprint would be for them to go and get players. Okay, how would this indoor compete with those schools? Oh, God. Well, not off the top of my head. Do any of those Macs have indoors? They must. They, they probably they do. do. I don't know if they're going to be as impressive as what's coming up here on the north side of town. I don't think so. I, I doubt on that front. Um, so, look, off the scheduling piece, you had a story on St. Thomas because they yes. are also on the schedule. The unique part about that, two things – that it's the final game of the season. The Bison in 2025, their bye week is slated for the final game. Larson and Phelps didn't want to do that, so they called up the Pioneer League and said, yeah, that would be free for us. And then, obviously, their first call, Jeff, was to St. Thomas, something we speculated about last summer when we heard that this was going to happen with with uh, the Tommies moving up to Division One. Yeah, we thought maybe St. Thomas would be a good U.S. bank state. Yep. And, and it would, but obviously this is the next best option. It's a good option for NDSU. But the Pioneer League for being generous, saying, okay, we'll accommodate our schedules in the last regular season game. So our school, and and it's good for the Pioneer because it's good for their schools getting the, the guaranteed Absolutely. money. Absolutely. It's $200,000 that is coming St. Thomas's way for so this really, game. So really, it probably was a no-brainer, I guess Absolutely. What I'm now St. Thomas has games with USD, Northern Iowa, UND, and the Bison already for their future schedules, which makes a ton of sense. Phil Eston told me they were going to do that when they moved up last summer, that they were going to make they're going to be a formidable foe. I mean, they're, 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 they'll uh, they'll get there. How long? Football. Five years? Longer? Yeah, it, it probably takes a while. Yeah. It's going to be a little bit. Craig Bull put together a team pretty quick. But they weren't going for Division Three. That's the issue. And we talked about this, how... Oh, come on. St. Thomas was D2 already. Uh, yeah. Their facility-wise, they're going to have to... Even for football, they're still going to have to crank it up, aren't they? For football? Oh, their locker room complex is fantastic. Yeah, that's pretty good. Their stadium, eh, it's all right. It's 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 better than some of the Missouri Valley ones we've it's been. It's better to. than Indiana State. Yep. It's probably better than Western. It's better than Western. Probably those two. Yeah. Is it, it better than the Dakota Dome? No, not, not anymore. Now. Not, not anymore. Now. Not even uh, close. Not anymore. Now with what they you did walk down into there. the Dakota Dome, yeah, man, they nice. did a good job. Yep. Even though we didn't get to see a game there, it looks we got a good. nice uh, <laughs> no game show, pregame show, no game show. So the other games added on. It was a home and home with East Tennessee State. Now that's interesting because that's. Well off the beaten path, right? I mean, that's a Ohio Valley team that just started playing football not that long ago that shut it down for a bit. I mean, they they had shut football down for 15 years before yeah, they came back. Yeah, it's interesting, a home-and-home. Home. Because, remember, 24 and 25 are 12-game schedules, and obviously the Bison already have a FBS opponent for 24. That's why I'm circling 25 as the destination game. Where, where is East Tennessee State? That is in Johnson City, Tennessee, by the way. That's I, in a song. That's in a song. I'll what song you, is it? I don't know. You can let somebody else uh, send us the information on that. Johnson I, City, Here We Come or something. I'm not going to sing it. Well, you know, Tennessee, you were down there for like the... Uh, I was there for seven weeks. I was going to say. <laughs> what was, it wasn't 15 American year old, Legion. 15-year-old World Series. Yeah, it was Babe Ruth. Lawrenceville. Right? Yeah. Johnson City is obviously in the eastern part of the state. If anybody wants to know how to get to the George Dickel Distillery, I will give directions. It's tough to find. I don't know this part of the country all that well. I've not been to Tennessee, so if we're still allowed to cover football by then, I'll be excited to go to, to Tennessee. And then they come back in 2026 as the home opener. The final game added was Austin P. And the Governors obviously made the quarterfinals in the FCS playoffs a couple years ago. Uh, they they struggled in the spring season. This is a one-game off. Bison are going to give them a $220,000 guarantee for them to come up to, to Fargo for that game. How many times did Craig Bull 
in the Monday press conference before playing Austin P in 2008. Go, yeah. let's go P. Yeah. yeah. I heard it quite a bit. That was a Thursday night game. Do you remember? That was the last time they played a home game on that Labor Day weekend mm-hmm. on a Thursday. And that That's was right. that was Nick Merton's first uh collegiate start. Forty one to six. Yeah. That was uh the start. And obviously that two thousand eight season was not what they were anticipated. They were the number one team in the country when they played that game, and obviously things went off the rails after that, but that was the last time they, uh, the only time they played Austin P. Uh, before we wrap, I had a couple stories I wanted to uh, to ask you about. One I saw yesterday on ESPN.com was uh, quoted Todd Berry, who's the chair of the American Football Coaches Association, and he says now with this one-time transfer rule, he sees that coaches are going to not recruit high school players, but instead go and get transfers from other teams. Just that, strictly transfers? That he sees that is the momentum and wants to put in provisions now about the one-time transfer rule because he sees coaches are going to do that. They're, they're going to get established guys rather than go the high school route. What do you make of so that? So what level of school? We're not talking the top of the top. I would think that's, The, the yeah. top of the top are still going to get the top high school kids. But he's saying... Go like all, Alabama just got Tennessee's best player. He thinks that's going to happen more often than going recruiting high school guys. I, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I think that could be a scary, scary thought going forward. And you wanted this. I do want it. I do, but I do think there's some, some provisions put into this as well. Oh, so you're waffling on I'm this. I'm not waffling. Yeah, you I are said, waffling. I said it from the beginning. No, you never said, let's do this, but we need provisions. You just... So here's what here's what he's this is what Barry said. Are we going to the Waffle House for lunch? Everybody is basically just suggesting I'm not going to recruit high school players anymore. Recruiting recruiting up other campuses is going to be the norm and high school recruiting is going to go away. I don't think there's any way around that unless the twenty five initials, that's the a limit right now. They can have twenty five initial scholarships on the roster. So that's for FBS. I don't think that's a hypothetical. I think that's a fact because I know what the coaches are going to do because we're all in these calls together. I I, I agree. There's got to be something. There's there will be some correction to the market. Maybe you do something similar to what the Northern League does. You can have so many veterans. You can have so many L four, L three. Maybe you go that route. Are we just overreacting because everybody's moving because of the one year a pandemic of the pandemic that the free year of eligibility? I don't think so. I tend to go that way. Like, I think I think things so will settle down see. this year. Okay. I do. Because there's another story out this and I had uh, an email sent to me on my show about this. Let's have somebody study over the next couple of years the amount of players that transfer and end up staying and how that works out and then compare that to see it going forward. Yeah, I'm doing my own local study over the next year or two to see how that's going to see where they go. Uh, who goes where and then if they end up playing I'd love to know the scholarship differential. Like, yep. the, like the, these four Bison basketball players, you can't say Wiss because he's going to graduate anyway. But the other three, I would I would wonder what kind of scholarship they got on the other end here. Yep, I agree on that front. I am interested as we go forward on all this, especially on the, on the one-time transfer rule now, of how that's going to affect just keeping players on teams. You know what I mean? Like, how much they're going to have to, you mentioned this to me on my show on Monday, re-recruiting your own roster becomes almost as important as recruiting high school guys now. Yeah, Todd Brown said that. I mean, every year, this baseball team, especially a year like this when they're successful, although they have a lot of seniors, but Kate, you know, you don't think anybody's little mentioned to Kate Feeney? Absolutely. I mean, his older brother went and played down in the ACC at North Carolina State, so makes a lot of sense. Uh, Mac Brown had the best comment of the week. I don't know if you saw this North Carolina coach when he said now with this rule in place that after the game, you're not going to go shake the opposing yeah. coaches hand. you're yeah. going to go shake the tight ends hand and say, boy, wish we would have recruited you. And now we can, <laughs> right? That's the new rule. I mean, that's, that's how it's going to be. Nick Gazer said it to me on my show this morning. He said he did not like the rule. Feels like we're the minor leagues now of the FBS and there, there's a lot of truth to that. And they knew that. it. They knew it when the, when it was coming down. There's a lot of truth to that. And that's the interesting part for this division that we cover, how many guys actually end up staying now for all four years. The elite guys that end up staying for all four. Can you shrink the portal dates? I Well, it is. Cause this this doesn't count this year because the, the rule got enacted late. So next year, I believe it goes into effect May 1. you got to let your coach know by May 1 of what you're doing. Because after that, then you're locked in, and you can't go without having to sit, I believe, is the way it works. So 
if you announce by May 1st and let your coach know, then you can Boy, go without penalty. There's going to be a ton of legal recruiting in April. <laughs> <laughs> Just a ton. It all it takes is well, a... Why even have those rules anymore? Well, how many... How many think coaches reached out to Sam Houston's players after the national championship game and South Dakota State to that Jaquez matter? Jaquez Ezzard? Yeah. Isaiah Davis, both. I'd have him on the horn immediately on that front. By the way, before we go, did you see South Dakota State got its quarterback quarterback from Samford? He had pretty high offers before he committed there. By it didn't the way. take long, and 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 John Stiglmeyer said, "Okay, um, we want to." We don't. We don't. We don't want to partake in this so much. We want our, our guys to be loyal. Oh, come on! But what this means, obviously, is Gronowski is done, and for next looks, year looks like for definitely for the fall, and that's a tough deal considering how good he was this past spring for the Jackrabbits. That's a tough deal on that front. All right, we got to roll. Good stuff as always, my man. Enjoy your holiday weekend. You do. It is kind of we're we're here already, aren't we? It is Memorial Day. June one is and Tuesday, a, and this and this is not this is an important holiday. So please remember Absolutely. that. Absolutely, go out there and and honor it properly. That'll wrap up the latest edition of the Colpack and Izzo podcast brought to you by Gate City Bank. For Jeff Colpack, I'm Dom Izzo. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you next time.